All right. Uh, we're live. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, this panel is uh, boosting VC capabilities. My name is uh, Jayesh Parekh. I will briefly introduce myself and then I'll have my illustrious panel members introduce themselves too. Uh, I live in Singapore. I went to the University of Texas at Austin. I worked for IBM for 12 years. Uh, but my last job was to bring IBM back to India in 1993. And now IBM's largest headcount in the world is in India. I was a co-founder of Sony Entertainment Television, which is a television network, which was we successfully exited in uh, 2013. And I was a general partner after that in Jungle Ventures, Fund 1 and 2. And now I'm a managing partner for Good Protein uh, Fund 1, which invests in alternative protein companies. So all protein companies uh, like Beyond Meat and Oatly have gone public uh, recently, and Impossible Foods and Eat Just will probably follow in the next few years. So Good Protein Fund, we invest in plant-based, cell-based fermentation or recombinant uh, alt protein technologies, and we invest all over the world. And you can look us up at uh, goodstartup.com. So we'll, as I mentioned to you, first the panel members will introduce themselves and, and then we'll uh, launch into a discussion. So I guess the topic which is boosting VC capabilities, uh, I just start off by suggesting that COVID, of course, brought start, stop, uh, blow hot, blow cold, VC funding yeah, to, to startups in India last year. So 2020, of course, many startups did not get funded. Many startups funding rounds were dragged out while some marquee deals continued to close, especially large funding rounds. And uh, India's ecosystem is now looks like beginning to thrive again this year. 635 VC deals were done this year of about 10 billion US dollars. And 502 million was raised by share chat. 500 million was funded by uh, Zomato Media, which went public recently, 400 million by Dream 11 Fantasy, 400 million raised by Dream Sports, and 350 million funded by Baiju's. Uh, in terms of the sectors that uh, will flourish, uh, one of the one of the thoughts is uh, now and post COVID, of course, it seems intuitive that the health sector will uh, receive a lot of funding. However, the mainstream tech sector is buzzing again and taking along with it fintech, edtech. Agri-tech, food tech, like alt protein, and uh, media tech, among others, uh, and 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 so also social impact and ESG space is also in favor these days. And so, uh, you know, let's let's hear from uh, let's start with you, uh, Vivek, uh, in Dutch Ventures. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good morning. Hopefully, all of you had an incredible Saturday. You know, for me, it was really nice catching up with some old pals whom we meet regularly in harasses only, you know. It's a once in a year kind of a thing. So, uh, yes, nice, nice afternoon. Very interesting uh, topic for the day, uh, boosting the VC capability. Okay, before I start, let me just let you know about what I've been, I've been doing. Um, I've been into consulting strategy and consulting for almost uh, 20 years, beginning of 91 till until 2010, 11. And that is when we founded this in Dutch ventures uh, with a Dutch law firm and me from India. And uh, we helped a lot of uh, Dutch companies, European companies to do business in India, dairy companies, um, aviation, so uh, when the Delhi and Mumbai airport was being modernized, so we were like invited by the Dutch government to help a lot of Dutch companies do business here. Now, uh, over the last five, seven years, as it happens with most of us, uh, we are, I also got into small businesses. Um, I'm into hospitality, into retail, we uh, manage one of the largest co-working space out of one uh, building in Gurgaon. And uh, we do, we have a retail place also over there. We have a lot of these QSRs. So that is how it goes. Um, delving into the topic, um, you know, uh, boosting the VC culture. I'm sure uh, some of the panelists here, they will be talking more of the, you know, the um, 
the industry which requires more impetus in the pandemized world. I heard this for the first time, pandemized world today. So, but I would like to discuss based on my experience on the languishing startups which are already there, which have been founded, let's say in the last two years, three years, five years, and they are having a lot of problems, right? And um, as I was mentioning that today's scenario can be very well compared to the dot-com burst which happened just after the millennial year 2001-2002. So we are witnessing a similar situation now. And if something is not done to curtail that issue, curtail the problem, we are heading towards a very, very, you know, difficult situation. Um, you would bear with me and appreciate that some of these startups which were founded, you see, just because we are in such a situation, pandemic situation, they have lost relevance. Um, their revenue model is no more uh, sustainable, right? Um, people have the the their investors they have deserted them maybe because of some reason you see maybe the investors don't have the runway their loss of lives right and similar situation can be with the the founders some members in the founder family founders they have they are no more they have lost their lives the key strategist in the companies they are, they are having some issues. So basically, to put together, see the existing companies also requires a lot of hand-holding in this situation. And I feel that the VC industry or the angel investing industry, they have a larger role to play and to ensure and to help in whatever way, you know, these uh, these companies, young nascent companies, they get the capital or they get some kind of a technical know-how. Some hand-holding is required. And uh, I feel uh, the government or institutions like DPIT in India, uh, CII, they can come together and do something about it. Um, the government can come up with, you know, some measures like, you know, soft loans, um, some tax exemptions, something, whatever little possible. But this is the time when, uh, you know, all of us have to come together and help and provide more important is because the VC, these companies, these young companies, they might be fragmented. They might be in different parts of India or world, right? So somebody, we need to provide them with a, with a platform where they can be identified. And this is where a dedicated effort is required. Thank you so much, Vivek. I think that's a great yeah. start. And uh, let me, can I please uh, request Peter, uh, may I request you to introduce yourself and uh, tell us about the weather in London. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, JS. I'm uh, Peter J. R. Irwin. I'm the director of uh, Edos Holdings. Uh, I run and manage a family office as well as uh, focus on larger institutional transactions uh, with, with international partners at the institutional level. Um, my exposure to India, just to give and, and background uh, first, is of course came from a family background. We were 50 years in insurance and financial services and exited that. Uh, so ha always had a financial background, but was very entrepreneurial from young age. And that immediately led me th through a number of relationships to actually living and working in India specifically in my early days as an entrepreneur. And that was a, an experience that I think has really shaped the direction of the rest of my life in a very positive way. Uh, because I learned the spirit and the fire and the uh, intellect of, of the Indian heartbeat of, of entrepreneurship. 
that not only beats within India, but also on an international basis in the non-resident, uh, amongst the non-resident Indians, and ended up making a tremendous network around the world due to understanding the mindset and getting invitations to, to work with other non-resident Indians. In fact, I was uh, based out of, out of Sydney, Australia at the time, and uh, I, ke I kept having to be on the, on the phone for hours at end uh, to India. So I thought, look, rather than me doing this at a distance, I would give an invitation to actually uh, live and work with strategic relationships I'd set up, originally to distribute products. And this is pre-2008, uh, well pre-2008. And uh, after, after spending quite a bit of time in uh, Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai, Bangalore, and other cities, I really got to understand uh, there's really two areas of entrepreneurship you could see. One where I think the Indian culture are amazing at taking a very standard uh, non-innovative business and just working hard and making it profitable because you've got a volume market. But then there's the other side where I see that there was a, a great amount of brain power uh, and, uh, and innovation that was cultivated. And I think that was through smart um, <clears throat> policy uh, and direction from the entrepreneurial community in the BPO area and the tech side. So what was happening, you were being service providers to some of the um, new and innovative companies, but then you were starting to learn, well, wait a minute, now we're service providers, now we can actually create our own solutions here. And there was also that intriguing trend of non-resident Indians that would formally go to uh, countries such as the UK, USA, Australia, get a job and stay there. Well, now they actually wanted to get educated abroad and come home to India to set up their business. There was an incentivization as well for the large corporate to actually, you know what, I'm now, I'm now more secure in life. Why don't I try that entrepreneurial venture? So the spirit is there, but I think the momentum and the in incentivization needs to be um, transferred uh, because you are well-versed in BPO, you're well-versed in anything to do with drugs and medical, well-versed in, in IT. Uh, I think there needs to be a strong incentivization for the non-resident Indians to, to continue to come back, uh, not just in terms of um, setting up in India, but also in investment. Because I think what, what India is lacking, which, say, Silicon Valley has uh, and the USA has, is an ecosystem to cultivate early-stage investment and give a, a higher valuation. So you either need to know how to structure your transactions more effectively and take them to the market in, to areas such as London, uh, areas such as uh, the USA. But I think even a, a step above that is to now look at uh, a new financial model where you can actually more effectively finance these uh, earlier and, and mid-stage companies to another uh, growth trajectory. Um, you have the advantage of a high volume market where you have a, a, a huge population. You've got, of course, uh, comparative to a lot of other uh, developing markets, a quite a, a, an inexpensive and um, educated um, a middle class. And, and so with this whole... I'll talk about it a little bit later um, in one of the other questions, but there's a great wealth transfer that's occurring from one generation to the next. Um, just in America, it's 68 trillion between now and, and uh, 2060. So I think India is well poised, but we've got this short-term glitch, uh, an issue with regards to COVID that I'm, I'm hoping does not become a liability. But I think you're well poised for the digitization of, of the world. Also other issues such as food security have become an issue. Uh, which I think, um, of course, um, well, Jay, you're very, very uh, versed in this area, and I think India should 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 look at and, and consider further. And also fintech, where I'm really focused. I mean, I could go on and on and, and, and talk solutions, but so I don't want to sort of take the floor right now. We can elaborate, but there there are a couple of issues that I would I would uh, uh, look at uh, expanding upon further. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, over to you, Sachindranath. <coughs> Hello. Thank you, Jayesh. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I uh, I don't know how to define myself, uh, but I I am a founder, uh, an entrepreneur of a financial services business. Uh, I started a business called You Blue Capital, which is uh, our aspiration is to build India's largest small business financing platform. It's a combination of uh, new generation technology led business and very large distribution and physical infrastructure on one side and large liability provider on the other side. Uh, we started this business in 2018. We are in, you know, pandemic has for most of the financial services in FinTech have been uh, a matter of concern. But given that I started the business with straight $40 million of capital raise, uh, we have benefited from uh, from the pandemic. 
in a way, you can say that our business was technically a VC-led business, but the, the only differentiation being that I started this in a listed company format and raised all my capital from private equity, not VCs. Uh, but we are growing rapidly well. Uh, we are seeing actually pandemic is accelerating the digitization in financial services. In my past uh, professional life, uh, you know, I have led large asset management business, VC businesses, and almost all format of financial services activity. One of the things uh, which I have been seeing uh, across the board, and we are seeing ATM would now come into the public market and among, as Jay Shu rightly said, among the sectors which are driving the capital from venture venture funds, uh, financial services and fintech is one of the large portion, although it has a little bit slowed down in the last three years. But prior to that, India was a very hot market for VCs in, in for the fintech. Uh, but in terms of the capabilities of the VCs, one of the problems which I see, unlike West, wherein all of tech is, is enabled by backing highly incredible professional people who have experience or agility or zeal to build large businesses. Uh, in India, and especially the VC, they chase uh, one after other. So if you have one large enterprise who have got money from few series A and series B, it's just doubling up the capital on top of that. Uh, so we, the whole VC industry is designed to support innovation uh, and new creation of businesses. That actually lacks in India. So you see this mad rush. So today, payment platforms uh, are hot. Uh, then some other platform would become hot. Four years back, market aggregations uh, platform were really hot, and people were pouring money in that. Uh, today, you will see uh, after macro and fintech when Paytm would go. So every time, if you you see there is a large round happening from SoftBank and Tiger Global and XZ. There are a lot more people would be willing to double up that, right? So I, I sometimes I call it game of poker. Right? So you have one valuation set in a second round of VC sets another 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 round of valuation, and people just keep putting money on top of that. But the real creation of and the innovation is not happening. So in India today, also if think of this that if somebody who has done a great technological innovation in financial services, I was a part of a large bank but is suffocated of not being able to create a venture out of it because banks won't do that. And if he comes out and wants to raise capital, VCs in India don't have capability to really assess the real innovation capability. And whether the person has real, you know, they are they're more followers of private equity model, this replication model. Oh, okay, show me where is it has been done in which market, or, you know, what is the you know, comparables, can this be scaled? So, uh, so for, and I'm only an expert of financial services. So for that sector to go, the highest amount of innovation uh, in terms of processing technology is in fintech. But for that to grow in a market like India, where there is it's very high quality, incredible mind resides, VCs have to build capability to really assess the part of innovation versus just looking at replication and doubling up capital on an existing platform. Uh, thank you, Shachandra. I, I think that uh, just following up on that, Vivek, I guess I'll first go to you and ask you for your, uh, you know, what do you see as the key trends and growth segments uh, and strategic considerations you think that are important, uh, you know, especially to support the post-COVID ventures? Okay. Uh, you know, as Shachandra said, you know, fintech would obviously is very, very important. But then... Uh, the easiest which comes to our mind would be the health, the pharma, and, you know, biotechnology, right? Uh, but we have to be mindful of the fact that whether in India we have the capabilities, the technical know-how, and the research to really pull, you know, these, these industries, these these young minds, right? So software, technology, fintech, yes, we already have it. But whether we have the wherewithal to support pharma, research in pharma, or in biomedical. My daughter, uh, she is doing her undergrad with a American university in biomedical sciences. 
and i was just talking to her that why don't are you thinking at all of coming back to india and doing something in india her simple question was that is there any company where i can come and pick up a job and i really could not answer her right there are very very few handful which are there in india so to answer your question jesh yes uh, ideally we have to and we should start looking at biomedical with great impetus you see you know we need to start looking at it that's going to be the uh, next thing next big thing to happen in the world ai we, everybody keeps talking about it right but are we ready for it is india ready for it is a moot question right so i'm sorry i cannot i cannot answer that in that way theoretically yes this is this is where we should we have already seen a lot of developments such as they will agree to it in fintech time a dozen you see there are so many players right what more as he was also saying what more innovation can happen over here and for that you really require a really highly skilled set of minds to come up with something different something new but then we have such industries which are absolutely you know virgin as they say right and yet we do not have anything happening over there so people like you jesh you have have been serial entrepreneur you have been you know helping different kind of you know minds different kind of industries people like you need to come probably you know identify people or industry or you know in different different set of industries you see and then help them grow or at least start the process right thank you vivek actually you, you know right at the beginning um, uh, during my introduction i mentioned that i am focused on agri tech specifically food tech and so alternative protein is a huge thing and it's very different from in from other parts of the world so in yeah. in us people eat hamburgers and meat in asia people eat seafood but in india 30% of the population is vegetarian so you need to really think about different ingredients also millets right things that are not just it's not just soy and peas and oats i mean oats is not as popular as millets for example but right. can i just request you peter to also weigh in uh, you know similar so they've talked about health pharma fintech is there any other key trends growth segments peter that you would recommend suggest yes uh, certainly let me just go to that now um well uh, yes well, the you, number one is of course you've got the, the huge amount of growth population that you're going to have over the coming uh, generate in fact you're going to surpass china so that's one advantage you have and with that um educated uh, youth market in the workforce is is one of your advantages uh and also a large uh, middle class that are of working age um segments that i like are obviously uh, medical tech uh also food tech fintech um in 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 particular because you've already learned uh as as bpo and uh sort of service providers to the other western countries on 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 how to do that but now it's the innovation and the creation of the home grown side i i like mobile innovations and i i i've noticed that even many many years ago we were talking about 2008 2009 there was a lot of mobile innovation that was coming there when there was a the deregulation uh, of of um of the telecommunications industry uh, a few years before that it caused a huge spike of investment and a lot of innovation um things around uh, apps and the like i think there's challenges to take into consideration however and it, again um it's 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 financing early stage and it needs to be an updated model for incubation and uh i think uh because you've got an incomplete ecosystem here you've got a, a knowledge of innovation uh but you don't have a, a cultivation of that entrepreneurial side because it it it, it it's it's very very difficult for some of these young entrepreneurs to get that initial funding um you've also got increased competition for the low and medium value added technolo- technology so having technology i think is commoditized there i can get software developed third party you know at, at a lot of countries and uh, eastern europe and asia are competing with you now um and of course there's um less domestic uh, uh obviously domestic grants and government assistance there they're the challenges but an app direction forward i think is of course maintain that baseline that you have in software and bpo um also 
highly incentivize the high value added segments, I think are absolutely key. And that, that's where India needs to go as, as number one. Um, which, now we're going to be in a global and digital world. That's where it's going. And that's the, the situation where you are prepared for it. But are you going to take advantage of a lot of things going from a, 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 a standard world to a digital, digital framework? Um, and again, of course, anything to do with sort of financial industries, cryptos, tokenizations, exchanges, service providers as technology, you need to be service providers around that, but also develop your own. Um, like if you're in, in, in a player in, say, the, in an exchange, in evaluation, ratings, data distribution of all of this information, uh, it assists you in, in, in not only cultivating your own industry, but serving globally on, on, on these uh, areas. Uh, I'll sort of save my uh, the next part of my discussion on, on how to take care advantage of wealth transfer, but there are a few sort of uh, points I would take mm -hmm. into consideration. For okay, the okay. Uh, Sachindra, I just wanted to check also, Sachin, with you. Uh, you know, you're in the fintech and fin financial services, but in general, do you see key challenges you think that should be taken into consideration uh, that we're likely to face, you know, locally in India post-COVID? So one, I one I think so. Uh, <clears throat> one is a lack of faith. I think so. That is the biggest problem. Uh, I think so. You know, humanity. If you look at even 1918 pandemic, finally uh, at the end of third year it was over. I think so. Uh, first people have to realize that any kind of human crisis finally come to an end. But I have generally seen investors, especially VC fund, that they look this as a as a time of opportunity versus something which is going to be perpetual and perennial. Right. So this is the biggest set of problem because crisis leads to innovation, but innovation need to be supported. Invariably, when I talk and you know in the core, even core financial services and and this, people tend to believe as if everything is going to be completely dead, and it is. People are actually so. At the end of August, you know, when I was talking to bankers, friends, you know, investors and all of that, nobody was willing to even have a conversation, right? We were growing we were, because I have this faith that this would be over. Obviously, it, it became normalized by September, second round of pandemic hit. Again, the same phenomena in March, April and May. And at this point of time, I'm seeing again a very serious exuberance. But people people watch this number of 30,000 to 40,000 on an everyday basis, right? Which is it, uh, you know, this is really painful. So people have to have faith, especially the investors and people who are putting risk capital, because you can price your risk. You can get it very cheap today. But believing, oh, let's wait for pandemic to be over before we take a decision. Now, that is not, uh, I think so that is the biggest challenge right now. Second, I think so, uh, there is a fundamental shift which this crisis would lead to. And, but I generally see, I'm telling you mostly in, in the fintech side of space and even generally, lot of new, lot of businesses continue to believe that pandemic would be over and they will come back to completely in the same model as they were, you know, operating before. This is a simple example, you know, we, we were discussing about, uh, you know, hiring, you know, we're ramping up our team from around 400 to 1000 plus people. And the first thing which my team, oh, we have to increase physical infrastructure dramatically. Or, you know, I was trying to hide a business head who was sitting in Delhi and you know, has to do a pan India. And first thing, you know, our team told no, but he's not in Bombay. But I said, last morning, we have been operating like this. How does it matter, right? Whether the guy lives in North or South, he can operate business from anywhere. That shift, uh, which should lead, is not happening. So people have to fundamentally look at their business and say, has this crisis leading to a permanent change? And how can I benefit from that permanent change? So there are two part of it. Investor, you know, cap, risk capital has to believe that this is not permanent. This disruption is not permanent by nature, and that's to have more faith. Businesses have to believe that this disruption is permanent by nature, and how do I benefit by resetting the model? I think so. This is the two contrasting phenomena. Okay. Uh, I actually want to sh shift gears uh, from the mainstream tech space and health and pharma fintech and all that. I, I'd like to now switch over and, and Peter, you have looked extensively at the flow of funds, right? In the ultra high net worth and the family office. And, and you've seen the transfer of wealth from one generation to the other exact, as well. And uh, I am keenly interested you know, in, the, in the focus in, on the social impact investment and ESG and that direction for alternative investment category. So I just want to uh, 
request you to weigh in you know with this in mind that what are the key areas of consideration that has captured your attention and you know how would you align this uh, from international to indian vc space for the you know in the future especially post covid well yes uh, j- just to frame this so everyone in the audience understands a family office um are a, a ultra high net worth family that manage their own money or a part of a multi family office where they've got a, a net worth and investable assets in excess of a 100 million us dollars um so that's very key um and with the great wealth transfer and again the statistic i mentioned before there'd be about 68 trillion in a us alone transferring from one generation to the next between now and 2060 uh um, that's not just within the family office segment but that is the flow of funds from baby boomers to millennials and to the next gen uh i think india is custom made for this uh transfer with the uh, the technological and arch- uh an architecture and infrastructure around uh, creating a tech world um to serve this market and the reason for it is of course the next generation are more tech savvy number one they're more esg and socially impact focused in fact i learned about social impact investing when i lived in india because a lot of the ultra high net worth individuals and other entrepreneurs i was partnering with they actually were creating sustainable businesses where they'd made their money but they wanted to give back um and of course but they wanted to make sure that those somewhat philanthropic initiatives uh or business initiatives the business initiatives they wanted to serve the poor so they would often give them free service but they would have a profit driven component to compensate uh and also the philanthropic initiatives sometimes they would have um some sort of monetizable small component but so they could keep subsidizing that philanthropic so th- i think you're very strongly poised to it but you've got to have a strategy and you've got to have a usp and saying how can we partner and serve you're in a, a, an amazing country now Shesh, which is Singapore, they always seem to innovate and find a USP to serve the market, and they've, they've done an amazing job in finding that. India needs to think a bit more nimbly to capture this um, situation. Also, as well, family offices already do invest in like social impact, etc. But a key trend I see now, you're you're at a, a tremendous forefront when you look at alternative investment categories such as property, equity, you look at venture capital, you look at, uh, of course. Um, Uh, hedge funds etc they're going through a transitional they 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 now obviously well established multi billion plus industries uh ESG and social impact investing is now getting some more traction at the institutional level that was cultivated by angel investors social impact the you see with the Biden administration coming in he's very much focused on gender equality and sustainability so it's it's on the lips of everyone now it comes into the proper financial structuring of how this is done So uh, that's an area I would I would say that India needs to think of um not only from the VC component just uh, of attracting the, the family offices and, and and the next gen market that do like those technological uh platforms they do like ESG but think how can we also uh handle this at an institutional level and not just be the service provider but actually structuring the financial solutions and the exchanges and the ratings etc it, it it again you you you're, you're a bit behind the, the, the curve so to speak because you've got london you've got new york city you've got frankfurt you've got singapore and others but i think you need to be thinking along those lines uh in 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 order to 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 do so uh, uh more effectively thank you so much peter and actually uh, i have a question here which actually i covered in the beginning but looks like some of the uh, books uh, were not there at the moment so the good protein fund right so is one of the question and it basically invests in alternative protein companies and uh, alter- all protein companies are like beyond meat and 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 oatly which have already gone public and then there are other companies like impossible foods and it just which will probably go public in the next few years and so good protein fund we invest in plant based cell based fermentation or recombinant all protein technologies and we invest worldwide so just uh, you can look it up on goodstartup.com uh, thank you for asking that question but again going back to again it's such a intersection of economics technology and impact right is all three together so uh you know i i just want to have any any further comments from you sachindra in terms of this space i mean there are large investors now like avishkar and there are many other vc funds in india as well uh, and a lot of money coming in to those funds from india and overseas so sachindra you have any comments on the that that space yeah so i think that there are only uh, two uh, two spaces which has been fairly active right uh, and this is two years so either angel or vcs which is series 
C, D, E, whatever you want to call it, right? Because VC is driven by large pool of capital, Sequoia and Klein Perkins. And, you know, as gracious, you know, in my past, you know, I used to operate world's seventh largest VC fund of fund business. And through that, I had access to almost all global VCs. Yeah. Uh, but actually, you know, Angel is good. So these are a bunch of, you know, professionals. You know, I, I get almost every day, seven to eight, you know, young people want to start something as in doing Angel round and so on and so forth. So that is a quite diverse community. And we, you, you know, up, less than half a million dollars of funding normally of a good idea get, get done. But from that point to taking it to a real size of VC to do, you know, 50 to 100 million dollars of rounds, Actually, the, there is an absolute vacuum. Right? Mm-hmm. I, you know, I innovated in my past life. I tried creating a professional angel, angel investing fund. But even for them, the, there is not a big LP base. Uh, the, as you know, the domestic capital deployment, so Indian family offices, as what you see in the West, there are only hardly few, three, four of them because they are the best suited to actually support a growth of a business from its uh, you know, first stage to third stage. So that continues to be a problem. The, the number of uh, new businesses across all sector which get incubated through angel round or family round. And from there, what achieves real scale, 50% of the failure of no capital structure to support from this stage one to stage three. Uh, so, you know, you have CBs and you have all of that, but everyone look at mature businesses. So unless India doesn't create domestic pool of capital, uh, which can really support this large pool of innovation or new creation of businesses, you will see very the concentration of power among few large businesses will continue to be there. Uh, again, I agree with you. I, I guess there are a few pockets which have done quite well. So, for example, Indian Angel Network, right? Yeah. They have a largest pool of four five hundred angels. They've done a great job. They invest, uh, you know, from few a few crores to a few million dollars. Many unicorns successful. They even set up an Indian Angel Network fund. And, yeah. and that fund is ex- doing extremely well also. And then, of course, you have Mumbai Angels and Hyderabad Angels. And then Thai is also, of course, in the in the, in the the midst of all of that. Uh, Vivek, I just wanted to check, check in yeah, with you to see. The yeah, point I was making, sorry, is that there's no institutional capital setup which supports on top of Indian uh, Angel. Yeah. Is, is but, but these days, you know, we see our deal flows like, you know, organizations like Sequoia Capital or Axel and, and you know, all of, all of these they are uh, piggybacking on these guys, right? So, of course, they want to make higher 20, 10 and 20, 30 million dollar investments, but in some cases, it's two to five and people like Bloom Ventures and a few others are there. Uh, and in social impact also, there are you know funds like Ankur Capital, Avana Capital. So there are a few. I think it's just starting to happen. I think Peter is completely right that it's just not arrived yet. And I think that early stage capital and that investment capital are not coming in. Uh, I just wanted to bring you in, Vivek, to just ask you, you know, do you have any advice, guidance in terms of uh, you know, appropriate direction for the Indian VC industry. Okay, before that, I have a small observation. Mm-hmm. You see, uh, we talk of the difficulties the VC industry is facing and lack of capital and appetite for that capital, the appetite for taking the risk. Whereas on the other side, if you look at the listed space, Most of the companies are doing so well. You see, the stock prices are historically high. The stock exchange index is historically high. So I can't understand the dichotomy between the two. Here also, I am told, uh, what I gather is the young investors, the young individual investors are taking a punt in the listed space. It is not the the new money the hot money is not coming from the existing the large institutional investors it is the young investors who have you know that additional capital and they are putting in that money in the listed space i really wonder why you know such a dichotomy exists why can't that same individual invest in some kind of a uh, VC industry, VC startup, can end of you. Yeah, I, I think it's a matter of asset allocation at the end of the day. Yes, we are very public uh, equity. Uh, most of the folks in India, right, are who, are who have wealth in their asset allocation, you see a very heavy skew towards public market, right, public activity. And so I think that 
uh, it's just one of those things and real estate is the second right and so i think it's just uh, you know but but peter please weigh in if you have any comments on that yeah yeah well the the issue that you have um uh, i think it's say compared to international markets is um not only the the the, the, the time but you've got a three to five year exit usually or maybe more in a western market but however you the public markets at least you have liquidity is the issue so you can convey to your investors what the exit is uh again because you've got the incomplete ecosystem you've got strength now you know technology you know innovation and you're an extraordinary entrepreneurial heartbeat but what i think is missing from that uh e- e- equation um is 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 the, the the of course is the um the actual exit in some cases it could be a black hole that they think they're investing in if they're a western investor i'm comfortable with india but i've done literally put my boots on the ground so i know what's there but for a foreigner that, that may have had a short business fly and doesn't understand that they haven't been handheld they haven't got those personal relationships and they maybe heard some of the horror stories so i think it's not just about the funds management and the liquidity it's the direct investment and co-investment area family offices are understanding this more greatly and can make larger allocations um in the in this sector but i i think that's the area that, that needs to be uh considered on on how to interface this with the international investment um and and use that background that you have now to um uh to actually create your own financial ecosystem with all this brain power and innovation and tech that you now know how to build thank you so much and so in this last remaining uh 3 to 4 minutes may i just request each one of you to just give your closing remarks one minute each if you don't mind sachendra you can go first please yes uh <clears throat> no thanks yesha i think so uh, i am of a firm believer that uh, post pandemic the next 10 15 20 30 uh, year india is, uh, is has really arrived uh the next whatever you call unicorns next 50 unicorns would continue to come from india the digitization i call india stack 1 and india stack 2 is is happening at a very rapid pace it just need little more imagination and uh, faith on people and you will continue to see growth spurting so uh, we are seeing a massive v shape recovery every time the pandemic happens so i'm quite bullish uh we see a, a true component of the india growth history, story i'm hopeful that more domestic vc capability get built over the next 5 years versus only offshore vc capability because that would power uh, the the real entrepreneurship in india thank you thank you very much vivek yeah so uh yes i'm very hopeful about india india's vc industry but i just hope and pray that the next unicorns from india are from pharma or from let's say biomedical biotechnology industry that you know india has been very good as a process you know india is known everywhere in e-commerce space but it's high time that we have our own products which become you know world leaders you see today we have the companies like tcs infosys you name so many of them but we hardly have any world products per se i don't know you see i'm not again qualified to say but then i just hope the next few decades we see one or two products like microsoft like oracle like uh, apple come out of india stable and we have the vc industry again you see we have the capabilities they say that indian entrepreneurs the best entrepreneurs in the world wherever they go they create wealth for themselves i really wonder why is it not happening in the country as sachindra is saying hopefully thank you vivek and may i just request peter you got just one minute now okay i i mirror a lot of what vivek said i do, do totally believe you've got the entrepreneurial spirit you've got the knowledge to do it but it's the the, the structuring the strategy and the execution to serve an international market i think is one area um areas in the short term i think uh should you utilize this this pandemic it's it's been a, a big drain on india as i understand but definitely medical tech is an area you could look at uh expanding and becoming more of an international player rather than being the the, the outsourcing uh post for for foreign companies you should in, innovate in those areas i also like what you could do in uh in the in the medium and longer term in agri, uh, agri and food um and also um other areas of, of of innovation because people need to eat uh that's a key component um but also as well um 
fintech exchanges, I think, is a key because um, you need to be able to structure and finance and cultivate the very innovation and the very venture, ca uh, venture capital opportunities that you're creating. So far, I don't think they have anywhere to go uh, and they've got to go abroad and they don't make it to that level in order to, to, to interface. So I think those need to be areas of consideration. Thank you so much. And I, I think we've just run out of time. I just want to tell you that I've really enjoyed this. And thank you so much for all, the, all, all of you to take the time to prepare for this panel. Uh, also, I just say that, you know, if you look, go back and look at 10 years ago, what the VC industry was like and five years ago and where we are today, I think we've come a long way. So while, yes, there are a lot of things that we need to do. And I think I'm just so confident that two, three, five, 10 years from now, when we get on a panel again, uh, we'll be seeing some amazing stories and not just limited to unicorns. It's a great story. Unicorns are good to do. In, in India, unicorn is massive. I mean, if we even get to 100 crore, that's really a fantastic number. From And we got more people doing 100 crore versus three people doing unicorn. I, I vote for many, many people doing 100 crores. With that, I would like to close this plenary and, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very great. much. Jesh, you have done a great job. We enjoyed the session very much. And thank you for all the hard work you have put in. Take care. Absolutely. Thank you. I think you've got to press the button.